is a binary operation, you have to make sure, folks, that you're allowing any possible pair of things to wind up going through the function, because remember, a function has to be defined on all of the possible elements in the domain. So that if I try a non-example, so there's a good place to show up in red, non-example, mm -hmm. how about division from, I don't know, Q, oh, let's do this one, Z cross Z to Z. Is not a binary operation. B -I -N -O -P. And the reason is a binary operation is re required to allow you or to uh, have it be the case that regardless of the pair that you hand the operation, the appropriate output needs to be in the same set. So even though that's sort of, I mean, it's not in bold phase here, the point is that what comes out has to be from the original set. It's not a binary operation. Well, in order to demonstrate that something's not what we might claim it to be, all you have to do is show me one situation where it doesn't work. For example, if I ask you to divide these two things, how about 1, 2, I'd get 1 half, and that's not in Z. So it's not a binary operation. I'll be more specific on Z. You might say, well, let's see, can I trick this thing to work out. What happened here? Division didn't work because if I divide two integers, I might get an integer, but I don't have to. How about if I try expanding the underlying set? How about on R cross R to R? Hmm. This is also not a binary operation. Mm-hmm. And the reason it's not a binary operation is it is the case that it's possible to plug in something here that doesn't get spit out here. Specifically, it's possible to plug in something here and then get spit out anywhere because you can't divide, for example, 1 comma 0 is 1 over 0, which is meaningless. Okay. So division is not a binary operation on the reals. It's also not a binary operation on the integers. It is, however, let's see, divide might be a binary operation on, I'm going to denote them this way, Q bigger than zero. Now, let me give you the R bigger than zero. I want to deal with Q in a minute. So this notation means, folks, look at all the positive real numbers. The real number's bigger than zero. To the real number's bigger than zero. This is a perfectly good binary operation. If you hand the division process any two positive real numbers, well, when you divide two positive real numbers, you don't have to worry about division by zero, so you can always at least divide them. That's not an issue. The reason you don't have to worry about zero is because I've explicitly excluded zero. I've excluded all the negative numbers, too. Oh, let's see, two. Yeah, and if I take two positive real numbers and I divide them, I get another positive real number. So this is a binary operation. So this is OK. Sorry. OK. I should have written it in black. But I got ahead of myself there. Okay. Is a binary operation. On the reals. On R bigger than 0. All right. Folks, there's lots of other things out there. And for homework, you'll look at a few more examples. But let me just sort of spew them. Uh, multiplication of 2 by 2 matrices. We've seen that already. The binary operation on the set of 2 by 2 matrices. Of course, I've got to be a little bit more specific. 2 by 2 matrices with entries in what set? We're going to talk about the collection of 2 by 2 matrices with entries in the reals. We're going to talk about 2 by 2 matrices with entries, entries in the integers, entries in the rational numbers, entries in the complex numbers. Heck, if you push things even further, you can talk about the collection of 2 by 2 matrices where each of the four entries are themselves 3 by 3 matrices. I mean, in fact, you can talk about collections of matrices, pick your favorite size, maybe two by two, where inside each slot you simply put elements from any other system that you're interested in. You can talk about multiplying. Hmm. So there's binary operations on those sets. If I hand you two functions, each of which is a function from the reals to the reals, and I can ask you to compose the two functions, and that will give you a function from the reals to the reals. So there's a binary operation on the collection of functions from the reals to the reals. 
And there's going to be many, many more examples of binary operations that we will look at over the course of the semester. Although, as we'll see by the end of tonight, we're not going to be interested in all possible sets and all possible binary operations. We're only going to be interested in those sets and binary operations that satisfy certain additional properties. Okay. And so what we're going to do for the next 10 or 15 minutes or so is build up those properties. What we need to do first is open up a can of worms that I introduced on Monday. This seems like it's sort of off to the side, that it's not really that central to the notion of binary operation. But it turns out one of the key sets and binary operations that we will look at in about week seven or so will bring to the surface exactly the issue that we're going to look at now. We're going to look at the issue now in the context of the rational numbers. And the point is we're all familiar with properties of the rational numbers. So if I bring up the issue now, and you can sort of think about it in terms of something you already are comfortable with, then maybe when we bring it up again, the hope is six or seven weeks from now, when we bring it up again, at least you'll understand what the issue is. And then you'll be able to so simply attack the issue in that new set rather than trying to get your head around the issue for the first time as well. And so here's an example. How about I'm going to define star, no, uh, define, I'm, yeah, I'll call it star here from Q cross Q to Q. So let's see. I'm attempting to define a binary operation on Q. So let's see. What do the elements of the rational numbers look like? They look like A over B, where A and B are integers, and B can be chosen to be bigger than 0. That's what any rational number looks like. So what, was, what would another rational number look like? Maybe something like that. Here's what I'm going to ask you to spit out. How about A plus C over B plus D? So I'm asking you to hand me any two rational numbers. Now I'm going to tell you how to somehow combine them. Well, the method that I want you to use to combining them is this one. Well, first you've got to ask whether or not when you take two rational numbers of the standard form that we talked about on Monday, where you can assume that the denominator is always a positive number, a positive integer, in other words, uh, an integer bigger than or equal to 1, and the numerator can be any sort of integer. Zeros and negatives are allowed in the integer sets, or uh, in the numerator sets, fine. So I define, I'm thinking, all right, it's a perfectly good binary operation, but what was the issue with the set Q? The issue was, in this particular set, there are many different ways to write or to name a specific element of the set. So the thing that we sometimes call 1 slash 2 can just as equivalently or correctly be called 3 slash 6 or 5 slash 10 or... And here's the point. If you hand me a function that somehow includes, well, here are the rationals, but any set that has this property that the elements can be named differently, you have to make sure that the description of the function that you've given doesn't depend on the name that you've given each of the elements of the set. That's a long way of saying, look, if you and your friend put in the same pair of rational numbers, it had better be the case that you and your friend get the same output for those two rational numbers, regardless of how you call them. So that, for instance, it better be the case, if this is a good function, if this function makes sense, that if you decide to put in 1 slash 2 and 3 slash 7, and your friend decides to put in 5 slash 10 and 6 slash 14, well, folks, the two of you have put in the same inputs. It better be the case that you each get the same outputs. But it turns out you don't here. This is not a well-defined operation. And if you're thinking, well, why the heck didn't he worry about that in the previous examples, this well-defined stuff? Because in the previous examples, presumably, the elements of the set can only be written in one way. If you tell me that you've written the integer and you've called it A, okay, you've called it A. Here, though, if you tell me you've written a rational number as A slash B, it might be the case that you can also write it as C slash D, where C and D are different, or E slash F, where E and F are different. Okay, so I'll put an exclamation mark here. Here's why. Well, in order to convince me that it's not a well-defined operation, all you need to do is produce one situation where you and your friend put in the same rational numbers, 
simply written in different form and convince me that you and your friend produce different outputs for this function. For example, let's see what happens if we do this to something like one half comma three sevenths. I'm just making up a pair. Well, let's see, what's the definition of this function asks me to do? It asks me to add the numerators and add the denominators. And what do we get? We get four ninths. So let me just be more explicit why that is. We get one plus three over two plus seven. In other words, we get four ninths. So if you choose to input these two, this pair of rational numbers, you'd get this out. On the other hand, if your friend chooses to input uh, 3 slash 6, and what's a, another way to describe this? How about 30 slash 70? Here's what your friend would get. 33 over 76. And folks, these two numbers are not the same. 33, 76 is not equal to 4 ninths. Hmm. So what's the issue? The issue is that it's possible to take the identical rational numbers simply written in a different way and view them as two different input values and wind up with different outputs. So just because I found one place where it's bad, it's bad, you're done. You walk away. So now your confidence is maybe a little bit shaken about working with the rational numbers. You think, well, things could go south. Yeah, things could go south. So the question might be this. If I hand you a proposed function from Q to something, like I did on Monday, or from Q cross Q to something, maybe from Q cross Q to Q, so that we have the makings of a binary operation on Q. The question is, how do you go about determining that it is well-defined? It's easy to show something's not well-defined, just write down a specific counterexample. But to show that something is well-defined, here's what a proof of that might look like. So uh, let's try another example. Uh, star from Q cross Q to Q, the idea is take star A over B comma C over D and define this to be A times C over B times D. You think, well, that doesn't look much different from what I just did. The only difference is in that previous example, I added numerators and denominators. Here I'm asking you to multiply numerators and multiply denominators. And what we're about to show is show that this function star is well defined. In other words, at least show that this thing gets off the ground. And then we can ask the question, all right, once we've verified that it's an honest to goodness function, then is it the case that all possible you know, input values q comma q can be put in? Is it the case that what comes out is in q, et cetera? So this is what we need to do to get it off the ground. And again, the reason that we didn't have to fret about any of that before is because in these other sets, descriptions of functions are, uh, uh, I'm sorry, descriptions of elements are, in a sense, unique. If you've called something z inside the integers, then that's it. I mean, if you want to call it w, that's fine. Then w equals z. The point is, though, in the rationals, we have this sort of, well, technically, as we saw on Monday, we have this equivalence relation on expressions, and we're going to make sure that the function satisfies or is somehow consistent with the equivalence relation. So how to do this? Well, here's what we need to do. We need to prove the following, that if you choose to write a rational number that way, but your friend chooses to write it this way, and secondly, if you choose to write the rational number c over d in that form, but your friend chooses to write it in this form, you have to show that if you input the pair of numbers in this form, that that equals what you'd get if you'd input the pair of numbers in the other form. C prime over D prime. That's the goal. So you have to convince me that regardless of how you describe the input rational number, whether you describe it as A over B or A prime over B prime, and then regardless of how you describe the second input rational number, c over d or c prime over d prime, you have to convince me that either way you get the same thing out. And folks, this is pretty easy to do. Look, but let's see. If I do star of this symbol, a over b comma c over d, 
what do I get? By definition, this function says you multiply the numerators, then you multiply the denominators. Oh, but let's see, this is properties of rational numbers. That's the same as A over B times C over D. Just arithmetic. Oh, but that is, wait a minute, A over B, by hypothesis, this is what we're assuming, is the same as A prime over B prime. Oh, and C over D is C prime over D prime. That's given information. That's what we're starting with. Oh, but that's nice because, look, that's precisely what star of A prime over B prime, C prime over D prime is. So check, this is a well-defined function. So here's an example of a function from Q cross Q to Q that's not well defined. Here's an example of a function from Q cross Q to Q that is well defined. The ones that are well defined, you technically have to do some proving. You're thinking, well, of course it's well defined, it's just multiplication. Yeah, you're right, that's all that's going on. All right, questions there, comments? What I'm, you know, as I, as I mentioned on Monday, part of the goal in here is to try to give you some idea of how things work. and. A question that comes up a lot for junior and senior, well, typically math majors is, all right, well, if somebody just drops one of these in front of you, here is a possible function, star from Q cross Q to Q. How the heck do you know whether it is or it isn't? In other words, you know, Mr. Instructor, how the heck did you know to look for a counterexample for that one but to try to prove that it was? Okay, well, because I, I, mean, I came up with the examples. <laughs> now the better answer is this. Presumably the work that has gone on behind the scenes that I haven't shown you just in the interest of time is, all right, I don't know if it is or it isn't. So I'll play around with it a little bit. And the first thing to do is to ask yourself, do I recognize this as something familiar? Now, I typically don't recognize situations where I'm adding in denominators. So I'm not familiar with the process that's being described here. So I don't know. So let's just do some examples. And I happened to pick one out of thin air, and right off the bat I found that the two were different, so I was done. It might have been the case here, folks, just by bad luck or good luck, whatever you want to view it as, that I might have written down two things that were different, and they actually did spit out the same thing. That's not enough to convince me that the function's well-defined. It only shows that it works for that particular pair. But of course, then if I try another pair, and it doesn't work, then I'm done. It's not well defined. If it works for that second pair, maybe that's growing evidence that maybe the function is well defined. And if the function is well defined, then you go about proving it. All right, well, so you'd say, well, maybe I can prove it's well defined. And you'd start about proving it. Of course, if you tried to prove this one's well defined, you'd get stuck somewhere, which might then lend some evidence that it's not well defined. And so, you, you know, if you don't know to begin with, you sort of try both ends and Quite honestly, and this is the heart of what a lot of mathematics research is, you, you, you write down some sort of statement you just don't know. You sort of get experimental evidence on one side, maybe it is true. You try to prove it, maybe you can't get there. So, you know, there's this sort of middle that you, you move to. Maybe that's a good thing to try to get across to the students in your classes as well. You know, if, if you're handed a statement, how do you know whether or not it's true? You might be able to luck out and prove it right away, this wasn't too bad, or you might be able to luck out and find a counterexample right away, like we did over there, but a lot of times it's not so easy. You might have to do three, four, a hundred, or you know, significantly more examples. Okay, questions? All right, let's look at a few more examples of binary operations. So, more examples of binary operations, examples of binary operations on sets. Uh, here's a good set. The set S is the set, the two by two matrices over R. So this is going to be notation that will be standard throughout the semester. So it's the collection of square matrices, each side, size two by two, where the entries are taken from the real numbers. And the operation star, so star of, well, what do we typically call two matrices? I don't know, A and B or M and N or something like that. It's simply A times B, matrix multiplication. And this makes sense. The point is if I hand you a pair of two by two matrices and I ask, ask you to do matrix multiplication, I get another two by two matrix back. So this really is a binary operation, is a binary operation on M2R. Okay. 
now there's absolutely nothing special about 2, and there's also really nothing too special about R here. So we can generalize. In fact, here's a, another set. The n by n matrices over R, you pick your favorite n. Pick your favorite n. So maybe the 3 by 3 matrices, or the 10 by 10 matrices, or the 100 by 100 matrices. I don't care. And the same operation, star equals matrix multiplication. And you get a binary operation on the set of n by n matrices. And hey, you don't want to use real numbers? That's fine. Use instead of entries from the real numbers, use entries from the complex numbers. That's fine. So maybe m n of the complex numbers, or the n by n matrices over the rational numbers, or the n by n matrices over the integers, or so each of these sets has a binary operation in it, and we call the binary operation matrix multiplication. So I'm viewing these as distinct or um, separate sets. So this is maybe the set of 3 by 3 matrices whose entries are from the integers. There's an example. Here's another example. The set of 7 by 7 matrices whose entries come from the rational numbers. There's another example of a set with a binary operation. All the binary operations are somehow, they look the same. They're all called matrix multiplication. That's all right. Hmm, sort of interesting. Here is a notational convenience. This gets really cumbersome. Star of a pair equals something. So this notation, folks, in a binary operation, if we talk about star of a pair, how about S comma T? That's typically what the inputs to a binary operation will look like, is usually denoted usually means, I think, every time for the remainder of the semester, simply by taking the star thing and putting it in between. I mean, when we talked about, you know, plus of A comma B equals A plus B, we might as well just call it A plus B. So star might be plus, it might be times, it might be vector cross product, it might be matrix multiplication, it might be a circle denoting function composition. It could be a lot of different things because we know there's lots of different ways of hammering things together Again, another thing. Heck, here's another example. It might be the case that the underlying things in the set are subsets of some given set, so are elements of the power set of some set, and the way I'm asking you to combine them is to form the union of the two sets, or the intersection of the two sets. So this symbol could, I mean, could stand for a myriad of things. All right, that's what binary operations are. Now, as promised, we're not going to study all possible binary operations on all possible sets. We're going to focus down a little bit. I'll give you some of the verbiage. You've seen some of it before. The, uh, I mean, I'll get to the definition of what a group is. That there's nothing mysterious here. That's the, the goal tonight is to write down what a group is. Uh, I'll give you all of the information you need to understand what it is, and then after the fact, and after we looked at a bunch of examples, I'll try to give you some sort of intuition as to why it is that this particular type of structure is sort of natural or becomes so important. I'll try to give you some sort of intuition as to why it is that the particular properties that we wind up listing to give a binary operation as a group turn out to be of interest. Okay? All right, so there are are various properties that a binary operation may or may not have. Operation on a set on a set may or may not have. You've heard of some. They probably, these words probably were handed to you back in third grade or fourth grade or something like that. For instance, some binary operations are what we call commutative. Some binary operations have the property that if the binary operation, if this function is handed a pair, A comma B, and you figure out what gets spit out from that pair, and then the binary operation gets the same pair of numbers handed to it, I shouldn't have said numbers, the same pair of things handed to it, but in opposite order, and you see what gets kicked out, is it always the same that 
throwing in the pair A comma B spits out the same thing as throwing in the pair B comma A? The answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. For instance, if the binary operation is plus, the answer is yes. If the binary operation is minus, the answer is no. Okay. Because, you know, you do, you do uh, I don't know, 3 minus 2, that's not the same as 2 minus 3. So that's sort of the typical example of a property uh, commutativity. Some do, some don't. Here's another example. Associativity, right? the associative law. So this is some magic law that was dropped on you many years ago, early in your mathematical career. You know, the addition of, of whole numbers is associative. You were told that and you nodded your head and you had no idea what the heck that meant. That's fine. Uh, your multiplication of real numbers is associative. Well, all that means has nothing to do with the order that you write things in. All that means is that the order that you group things in isn't relevant. So that if you somehow multiply A times B times C, it doesn't matter if you first do A times B and then multiply that in turn by C, or whether you first do B times C and then you in turn multiply it by A, you get the same answer. And lots of binary operations on sets are associative, and some binary operations on sets are not associative. Associativity. I mean, I can formally write down what it means for a binary operation to be commutative. I can formally write down what, a binary what it means for a binary operation to be associative. That'll be easy. Let me talk you through a couple of more properties that various binary operations on sets may or may not have. Again, what I'm trying to play up here is the idea that we can talk about binary operations, but then there are specific properties that we can ask whether or not those binary operations have. Commutativity is a good one to keep in mind because you know a lot of operations that are commutative and you know a lot of binary operations that aren't commutative. Like, well, let's see, we looked at one division on the positive real numbers is not commutative. Subtraction on the whole numbers, whole integers, not commutative. Heck, multiplication of matrices is not commutative. So there's lots of, for associativity, there are some examples of binary operations that aren't associative. I'll say most of them, most of the natural ones are, although subtraction turns out to not be. If you do A minus B minus C, that's not the same as doing A minus B minus C, because then the minus C winds up with a plus sign on it. So there are some that aren't. Here's another property. Uh, think of the following. Yeah, this is a good one. Um, the example is the set of even integers. So positive, negative, and zero. So any, uh, the collection of integers that can be viewed as multiples of two. Two, four, six, eight, zero, minus two, minus four, et cetera. Uh, if you multiply any two even integers, get an even integer. So it turns out multiplication on the set of even integers is a binary operation. Take any two even integers, multiply them together, get another even integer. No big deal. But that particular binary operation doesn't have a very important property, one that we looked at on Monday. It's missing this. In other words, it's the case that in the collection of even integers, where the binary operation is multiplication, there's no special element that somehow, well, I'll say acts as an identity. There's no special element that has the property that when you multiply things in the set by that element, that the thing in the set remains unchanged. That's just a fancy way of saying one's not in there. Okay. So in that sense, the collection of even integers with multiplication is different than the collection of all integers together with multiplication, because the collection of all integers with multiplication has this special element in it. it. Happens to be called the number one here. But you know what? This set has such an element in it, too. If we're looking at the collection of 2 by 2 matrices over R, there is a special element in that set with the property that when you multiply it times anything else in the set, you get that other thing back. In that situation, it happens to look like 1, 0, 0, 1, the identity matrix of 1, 2. So it doesn't necessarily have to look like this, but in this set, there is an element that somehow behaves like the number 1 does when you multiply it. Right? So some sets have such a thing, and some sets don't have such a thing. So I'm going to list that out as existence of an identity element. Example, existence 
of identity. And maybe what I should have been doing here, actually, yeah. Um, how about yes, no. So for each of these properties, let's give a set together with a binary operation where the set has the property and then a set with a binary operation that doesn't. Here, um, how about the integers together with addition? Yeah, that's easy. Addition on the integers is commutative. Uh, give me an example of binary operation on a set where the binary operation is not commutative. How about the two by two matrices over R with multiplication is not commutative. Uh, an example of a set where the operation is associative, let's try this one again. I'll use Z plus a lot, it's a pretty famous one. Addition on the integers is associative. Um, subtraction on the integers is not associative. Now to convince me something doesn't have the property, all you have to do is convince me that in one particular case things don't work out. It's easy to write down a pair of two by two matrices. You multiply them in one order, you get an answer. You multiply them in the other order, you get a different answer. So that, and then you're done. Similarly for subtraction of integers, I can convince you that this isn't associative. Why? Because if I do something like one minus three minus seven, and I compare that to one minus three minus seven, let's see, what is this? This is minus two minus seven, so I get minus nine there. And this is one minus minus four, and so this is three, and these obviously aren't equal. So there's a proof by counterexample that subtraction on the integers is not associative. Existence of an identity, hmm. how about the integers under multiplication? I'm gonna put the integers under addition here too. How about the even integers under multiplication? Now I'm going to denote the even integers by simply writing the number 2 in front of the integers. So that's the even integers of multiplication. Hey, you know, the collection, I'm going to put this over here. If I look at the integers with addition, it's a perfectly good binary operation on the set of integers. You add two integers, you get another integer back. There's an identity element in that set. It happens to be called this. This thing has the property that if you take it and you combine it via this operation with anything else in the set, you get the other thing in the set back. It doesn't change. Okay, there's one more example of a property. Example, this fourth example only makes sense in situations where you have a binary operation that has an identity element. Okay, so only makes sense makes sense when the set together with the binary operation has an identity element. What do you want to call the identity element? Well, you might want to call it this. That'd be reasonable. Of course, in other situations, you might want to call it this. That'd be reasonable. Of course, in other situations, you might want to call it this, 1001. So what we do is we come up with a letter that in general stands for this special thing called the identity element that doesn't sort of make you always think of this because it might be this, because it might be this, because it might be a lot of other things. We typically call it E for reasons that I really don't know. Probably because it came out of the Gerdigan School and maybe this means identidad or something. I just made that up. But anyway, <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if that the genesis of using this letter to denote identity element was somehow from the German. All right, here is the example. Look, this set had an has an identity element. It's called one here. The integers with multiplication has an identity element. Question, is it the case that if you hand me anything in the set, two or seven or nine, I don't care, that you can find something else in the set so that when you combine those two things via the identity, via the binary operation that you get the identity element. Well, in the integers the multiplication, the answer is no. If you hand me the number seven, can you find something to multiply times seven to give one? No, because one seventh isn't an integer. Huh. On the other hand, if I look at the collection of, and we did a little bit of this on Monday, it's sort of opening up the, the idea for right now. If I hand you something like the positive real numbers, and I hand you a positive real number, 
is it the case that you can find another positive real number so that when you multiply the two together that you get the multiplicative identity? The answer in that case is yes. So in certain situations, each element in the underlying set has a twin or a cousin or another element in the set so that when you combine those two together you get this special one. So this is usually called existence of inverses. Existence of inverses. So let's give an example. Example, uh, here is a set, the real numbers bigger than zero with multiplication. This is not only a binary operation on the set, it's a binary operation that has an identity element, it happens to be called one, and it has the property that every element in the set has a paired element or another element that it associates with so that when you multiply together you get the special identity element. Let me give you another example. If I look at the integers with addition, so the binary operation on the integers now is addition, well this is a binary operation. The binary operation on the integers known as addition actually has an identity element. It's called this, zero, you add zero to anything, it doesn't change the other thing. That's what identity element means. Question, if you hand me any integer, can you find another integer so that when you add two together, you get zero? Sure, because if you take any integer, just look at its negative, which is again another integer, and if you add the two together, you get the identity element of the set. So here are two examples of sets with binary operations, each of which has an identity element, so that this thing actually gets off the ground, and it's the case that for every element in the set, Things work out nicely. Things where this doesn't work out so nicely are maybe the set of all real numbers with multiplication. Think, well, what's up with that? Is it the case that, well, first of all, is it a binary operation? Sure, just multiply any two reals to get another real back. Is there an identity element in here? Yeah, the number one is. Is it the case that if you hand me any real number that you can find another real number so that when you multiply the two together, you get one? Almost, except for zero. There is a bad one in here. Everything else works, I admit that. But zero doesn't, I'll put in parentheses, since zero has no, and here's a word that we'll use, inverse. Here's another one. Let's see, the collection of two by two matrices over the reals with multiplication. Here's a binary operation on that set. Multiply any two two by two matrices over the reals together, you get another two by two matrix over the reals. So it's a binary operation. There's a special element in here that acts as the identity. It's one zero zero one. Question is it the case that if you hand me anything in here, that you can find another thing in here so that when you multiply the two things together, you get the identity. Sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. I mean if you're thinking, well, start with zero, 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 that one's bad. Yeah, it is bad, I agree. There's other bad ones too. Like one zero two zero is bad. Like three six two four is bad. Like, how am I making those up? Because it turns out, folks, the question that we're asking here boils down to nothing more than which two by two matrices have inverses. And those are precisely the ones that have determinant not equal to zero. Hmm. So the question of existence of inverses turns out to be one, even in that situation, even the situation of multiplication of matrices that corresponds to something that you've seen before, corresponds to something in linear algebra. All right. I could, I mean, I could spend the next half hour listing additional properties that binary operations might have or might not have. I've listed out four here. I hesitate to give you the commutativity one first, and the reason is this. In some sense, that's the most obvious one. That's maybe the one you're most comfortable with, because you've heard that word before, at least, and it makes sense. Is it the case that if you do things in this order, that's the same as having done them in the other order? Yes or no, and there's examples of both. It turns out, though, that when we get to this fundamental structure, this thing called a group, the commutativity does not play a role. It does not play a role in the definition. It'll play a role later on. There will be some special groups that happen to be commutative, but some are not. So we've got to be a little bit careful, that's why I hesitate to give this one first, but it's just an example. These other three things are also examples of properties of 
binary operations on sets. So here, finally, without further ado, is the definition of the most important property of, well, the three most important properties of binary operations that we're going to group together and call any binary operation that has all three properties a group. So the definition is this, let star be a binary operation on the set S, a set S, then S with star, and that's the standard notation, tell me what the set is, tell me what the binary operation is, that's the notation that I've been using all throughout here. I've told you what the set is and I've told you what the appropriate operation is, is called a group. group. In case three things are true. In case first uh, star is associative. This one, we know what associativity means, but you know what we can write out associativity formally. In other words, i.e. for any three elements, elements, I'll call them A, B and C in the set capital S, if you hand me those three elements and you perform the binary operation between A and B and then take the result and combine it with C, that what you get is the same thing as if you had grouped them, not necessarily by changing their order, but by simply grouping the pairs differently. Look, this makes sense. If I've got a binary operation on the set, if star is a binary operation, it means that A star B is in the set, so it makes sense to somehow take this element of the set and combine it with that one, and I get an element of the set. And the requirement is that whenever you do that for any three elements of the set, that you get the same output as if you had done the binary operation by grouping differently. That's the associativity law. I mean, you've seen this before with pluses, and you've seen it before with, you know, with multiplications, and you've seen it in matrix multiplication before. Richard, question. So can a binary operation with a two-element set be associated? Oh, good question. Uh, yeah, so the question is, well, what if you don't have three elements in the set? And the answer is A, B, and C don't necessarily represent different elements. They might be the same element taken A, A, and B. or a. So I'm not precluding the possibility that I've handed you some overlap. So the answer is yes, it can be. Because then the situation simply boils down to, well, take any two of them and then just put them in the appropriate slots and see what happens. But typically we'll be looking at, I mean, not always, but typically we'll be looking at sets that have more than three. Okay. For any elements, sorry. All right, that's the first requirement on a binary operation that we will need in order for us to call it a group. Here's the second property that we will need in order to call a binary operation a group, that uh, uh, S contains an identity element for star for the operation. In other words, well, what does it mean to be an identity element? It means that there's a special element in there. I'm going to call it E, as I mentioned before. There exists an element, we'll call it E in S, with the property that the property that for every element in the set, let's call it A in S, if you do E star A, in other words, if you combine the special one with the other one, I don't care what the other one is, that you get the other one back. And if you combine them in the other order as well, A star E is A. In other words, the second property that we're going to be interested in is this property of the existence of an identity element. And all I've done in both the case of associativity and existence of identity is simply written out using this general star notation, what the heck the property means. Associativity just means group in a different order. Existence of an identity means there's a special element in there with the property that when you combine that element with anything else, that it doesn't change the other thing that you get A. 
And here's property three. Uh, existence of inverses uh, for each element A in the set there is and there exists an inverse there exists an inverse here's what that means in other words more formally for each element in the set let's call it A there exists an element, I don't know, I'll call it B for now, so that, what does it mean to be an inverse? It means when you combine the given element, A, with this paired element, with this twin, when you combine them together, that you get the special element, this thing that's called the identity. In other words, when you do A star B, you get E, and if you do B star A, you get Now, there's lots of comments to be made. The first comment is, you know, why is it the case that I had to write each of these out twice? You're thinking, well, isn't that enough? Doesn't that necessarily tell you that? And the answer is, well, no. If I compute E star A, there's nothing in this list that says that E star A or anything star A has to give you the same answer if you turn things around. So the stipulation that this thing is called the identity element means you have to check both that it's the case that when you do the operation with it on the left that it doesn't change the original given element and if you do it on the right that it doesn't change the given element. Similarly here you have to check in order for this thing to be viewed as or to be called the inverse of the element A you have to make sure not only that when you perform the operation of A with B in this order that you get the special identity element but that you also get the identity element when you perform the operation in the other order. So that's a mouthful, but here's the definition of a group. If you have a binary operation on a set, and if the binary operation satisfies these three particular properties of binary operations, if it satisfies all three of them, then we call the set together with the binary operation a group. So what I want to do is give I don't know, 10 minutes worth of examples, and then maybe the last five minutes, I'll try to give you some sort of gut feel as to why it is that these three particular binary operations turn out to play such an important role. David, question? Um, so, would we consider um, this set being a binary operation before stipulation? Oh, that's a good question. Is that something we should ah, binary operation? that's a great question. Yeah, so, in fact, what I've done in previous semesters. I mean, that's an absolutely great question. So here's David's question. Look, the definition of a group is a set together with a binary operation that satisfies these three properties. In some sense, you might want to think of the entire situation as we've got four things that we have to check in order to make sure that the thing that we're looking at is a group. The first thing we have to check, maybe you want to call it step zero is, we have to check that the proposed thing together with the proposed set is actually a binary operation on the set. And that sometimes requires a little bit of work. I mean, what we spent the first half hour of today doing was looking at certain situations where we do or subsequently don't have a binary operation on the set. So some authors and some instructors view this as a separate condition. Yeah, but typically it's more natural to say, look, You've been handed a set, you've been handed an operation, you've done possibly some work to check that that operation is actually a binary operation on the set. All right, now we can actually start talking about whether or not the thing is a group. So if you're handed for a homework question, here is a thing, a set, and here is an operation. Does this set together with this operation yield a group? Technically what you have to do first is a step zero. You have to convince me that the operation is actually a binary operation on the set. Then once you've sort of gotten things off the ground, then check, is it associative? Is it the case that there's an identity element? And is it the case that each element has, multiple, has, has an inverse? Okay, so that's a great question. Careful. Yeah. All right. So might need to be checked. Need checking.
But at least in all the examples that we will do here, uh, the set together with the proposed operation really will be a binary operation on the set. So that it will boil down to deciding whether or not each of these three properties are satisfied. All right, examples. I could spend hours. Well, examples of groups. Here's a fundamental example. The set of all integers together with addition. So we've handed you a set together with a, well, together with an operation, I need to mumble, oh yeah, addition is a binary operation on the integers. If you take any two integers and you add them together, you get another integer. No big deal. There's no well-definedness issues. There's no dividing by zero issues. So check. We get off the ground here. Question, is it the case that each of these three properties hold in this particular setting? Well, let's see. We just got to go through and check. So binary operation, check. Associativity, I'm going to say check. And here's the deal, folks. Checking associativity on all these is, I mean, it boils down to you know foundational mathematics or something. So I, what you'll get to do in here for all of these is say, I'm supposed to check that it's associative, but I know it's associative by what they told me in third grade. Check. <laughs> That's all. Okay? I mean, eventually we're going to get to, is matrix multiplication associative? Yeah, it is, because they told me that it was. And then, or is function composition associative? Yeah, it is, because it just is. Right? So the associativity issue is sort of a non-issue for us. Uh, existence of an identity element. So I'll just write it as identity element. Is there a special thing inside this set that has the property that when you combine it with anything else in the set in either order that you get that thing back? Sure, yes, zero is an identity element for the set. Why? Because zero plus, let's call it z equals z and z plus zero equals z for every every z in the set. That's what it means to be an identity element. I've identified something that works. And you might say, well, how did you know that that was in there? Well, I just, I don't know, got lucky or I knew enough about this set to point to it and say, yep, this is in there and it works. Fourth, existence of inverses. It's third on the list, but it's the fourth thing that we actually have to do to Make sure that we've got a group here. Uh, existence of inverses. Um, inverses. Sure, here's what we have to do. We have to take any, let's call it A in Z, show that there is or exists something called B in Z so that when you add two together, that you get zero, and when you add them in the other order, you get zero. And that's exactly what this says. Notice I've used the notation plus rather than star here because that's what the particular binary operation in this set happens to be. How are you going to do this? Well, you're just going to hope to somehow have an algorithm that cooks one up for you. Well, yeah, here it is, but let b equal negative a. The point is, minus A is in Z. I'll put a check mark here. This step is key, folks, because in a lot of situations, what you'll be able to do is say, well, sure, I know how to cook up an inverse. Just put its negative on there. Or maybe if the operation is multiplication, I know how to cook up an inverse. Just do one over it. But that operation might not give you something back in the set. For example, if the set had only been, let's say, the positive integers or the natural numbers rather than all of the integers, it turns out that all of these three operations uh, or all of these three properties are satisfied. It's a binary operation. It's associated with it has an identity element. But existence of inverses, if you try to do a negative, I mean, the negative of a positive integer is a perfectly good thing. It's just not in the given set. So minus a is in z, and the point is, if I do a plus minus a, I get 0. And if I do minus a plus a, I get 0. So check. So done. We've 
now run through all of the steps required to verify that the set of integers with binary operation multiple uh, with binary operation addition forms a group. What do here? Not too bad. All right. Other examples. Examples. Let me save this for non-examples. Examples. Uh, Hmm. This will be sort of an interesting one. I'm going to hand you the following four elements. One, minus one, complex number i, and complex number minus i. So if you want, I can actually draw a picture in the complex plane of what this set looks like. I'm asking you to take that complex number, that complex number, that complex number, and that complex number. So there's the set called S. And the operation is going to be complex number multiplication. So step zero, is this even a binary operation? Is it the case that this set consisting of four elements has the property that if you take any two elements and you combine them, in other words multiply them, you get something back in the set? Well technically you've got to check a whole lot of things, but it's not too hard to see. Hey, if you do that times any one of them, well that's no big deal. You, if you do that times that, minus one times minus one, you get that. If you do that times that, you get that. If you do that times that, you get that. It's a complex I. If you do that, so it's okay. Yes, just check it. Just check. And folks, that's going to be a, I mean, I don't say that facetiously. It's here's a set. There only happens to be four things in it. I'm proposing that this set has a certain property. How do you verify that it does? Just pound it out. See what happens. All right, now we'll be able to do this a little bit more subtly or sort of m m more stylistically in about two days. But for now, that's fine. All right, how about associativity? Sure, because all we're doing here is we're multiplying complex numbers. I'm not multiplying all the complex numbers, just some of them. But hey, I don't care. If you've got a subset of something that's associative, it's by default associative. So that's check since on, on the complex numbers, is associative, so that's no big deal. Hmm. Let's see. Identity. Is there a special thing in this set with the property that when you combine it with anything else in the set, it doesn't change the other thing? Sure, there it is. If you do one times one, you get one. If you do one times minus i minus one, you get minus one. Sure, one. Works. How about existence of inverses? Uh, inverses. This one's a little subtler and typically is the hardest one of the four, I don't know if you want to call it three properties or four properties to verify. The binary operation property together with the other three. You have to convince me that if you take anything in the set that you can pair it up with something else so that when you combine the two things that you get whatever you've identified as the identity for the operation in step three. All right, well, let's check that it happens. Let's see. If I start with that thing in the set, can I find something that I can combine it with to give one? Sure. Hey, there's no stipulation. You have to pick something different. You can pick itself. That's fine. Let's start with the second thing in the set. Can I combine it with something so that when I combine the two things together, I get one? Sure. How about minus one? So there is an inverse for that element. It happens to be itself. How about this one? Is there something I can multiply or combine with that to give one? Why is that? Because let's see, i times i is minus one, but I've got a minus sign. Right? So I get one. And finally, if I take the fourth thing in the set, can I find something in the set to combine it with to give one? The answer is yes. So check. I've checked the existence of inverses just by, and quite honestly, folks, this is the, the terminology that's used in mathematics by the brute force method. You just grind it out. You did it because I checked all the possibilities. I mean, you don't always have this opportunity or this method at your disposal because the set might be infinite or it might be just too big to get your hands around, but you know, small. Oh, so this is a group. So this set S. 1 minus 1 i minus i together with complex number multiplication is a group. Pretty important example of a group too. 
So there's a couple of examples. What we will do for the first, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes of next Monday is look at more examples of groups. But as promised, what I want to do is, um, let's see, give me a minute here. Yeah. Okay. Um, is try to give you, as promised, some sort of intuition as to why these, I'll call them three properties, I'll assume that we've got a set with a binary operation to start with, happen to be somehow natural together. So this is a sort of final thought or a quick aside about why these three properties. You know, what's so special about grouping them together? And I like to view it as this. Whenever you're in a group, you're in a situation where you can always solve linear equations. So think of it this way. If I start with an equation that looks like uh, 2 plus x equals 5, there's a linear equation. So the variable in there just appears as sort of order 1. Can you solve that equation? Yeah, you can solve it with the integers. x equals 3, no big deal. But can you solve the equation 5 plus x equals 2 in the positive integers? No, because you might not have negative 3 in there. So think of it as the positive integers are pretty good, but they don't allow you to solve all possible linear equations, even if the things that you're using are positive integers, because you can't solve 5 plus x equals 2. So what do you do? You sort of expand out. You throw the negatives in together with 0. And what you wind up with is a, a situation where you can solve all linear equations. a plus x equals b, you can always solve that equation in the integers. Uh, how about an equation that looks like a times x equals b? So there's a linear equation corresponding to the operation multiplication. Well, you certainly can't always solve that in the integers. 2 times x equals 1. The answer is a half. All right, so you say, well, how about if I try to solve it in the rationals or in the reals? 2 times x equals 1, yeah, I can solve that linear equation in the reals. Of course, I can't solve uh, 0 times x equals 1. So well, that's unfortunate. Well, I mean, it is unfortunate. So there's a situation of an equation, a linear equation in the system that you can't solve. It turns out that these three properties, associativity, existence of an identity, and uh, existence of inverses, are precisely the three operations that you need, or the three properties that you need, in order to conclude that in the system that you're working in, you can always solve a linear equation. In other words, these three together allow you, allow you, to solve any, I'm going to call it linear equation in the system. In the system, well, because we typically don't call the generic binary operation plus or times or matrix multiplication, we call it star, i.e., we can solve a star x equals b for any choices of A and B. If you're in a group, you can always solve these. How do you do it? Well, what are you trying to do? You're trying to somehow figure out what value of X works. So how the heck are you going to solve it? Well, what you do is you take whatever is the inverse of the element A you somehow multiply both sides of the equation by this. You then use associativity. You then use the existence of an identity, and you wind up getting a solution for x. Let me do that for you, the one minute version. So I want to show you how to go about solving this equation, and I want to convince you that I'm going to use exactly the three properties that are inherent in the definition of a group. By definition of a group, this thing has some, what do we call it, inverse. What do you want to call the inverse element? Let's call it C, because I've used B for something else here. So let C be uh, an inverse for A. 
So I've used property three of a group. Now multiply, I shouldn't use that phrase. Now perform the binary operation on the left with that element C. So if I have two things that are equal, then I perform the binary operation. That's legit. Then the equality remains. So I've used property three. Now property one says associativity. So by associativity, I can regroup this left side. I get C star A star X equals C star B. But wait a minute. These are inverses. So what's C star A? Is E. But wait a minute. What happens if you combine anything in the system with E? You get it. I don't care what it is. So what I've just done is I've solved the linear equation for x. I've isolated x, and in fact, I've given you the answer. It happens to be c star b, where c is the inverse element of a. The point is these three properties together actually are natural. They allow you to take anything in the given system, regardless of what the underlying set is, and regardless of what the appropriate operation is, whatever the binary operation is, and it allows you to solve things that look like either A plus B equals C or A, I'm sorry, A, yeah, A plus X equals B or A star X equals B or A times X equals B. Okay, questions, comments? All right. Um, yeah, that's a good place to stop then. So I gave the homework assignment out on Monday, if you need to get a copy of that, it's on the web. You can grab it. Uh, if you didn't get this information about the SI sessions, you can come up and grab one now. I have office hours tomorrow if you want to come by. And if I don't see you before then, I will see you on Monday.